Our theme this month is democracy, appropriate given that tomorrow is our municipal election day. The fifth principle of Unitarian Universalism reads this way. We covenant and affirm the right of conscience and the use of the democratic processes within our congregation and in society at large. There are a lot of ways of defining democracy, but usually the definition is characterizing these ideas in one way or another. A guarantee of basic human rights, freedom of opinion of expression, governance within the rule of law, and equal voting rights. Even with these defining characteristics, there are many different ways in which democratic principles are put in place, and not all are equally successful. In a recent essay, David Mosscrop, a Canadian writer who often appears in McLean magazine, wrote this. Evaluating democracies is tricky work. There are competing conceptions of how a state should be organized and of which rules are best. Indeed, we've disagreed with one another over this for thousands of years. Some prefer a participatory state where individual citizens play an active role in self-government. Others prefer an arrangement where very little is asked of citizens and in which governments between the elections are left to their own devices. Some want, to be as me- want there to be as many elected positions as possible, including, for instance, judges, so that the popular control of who governs extends widely across the country. Others argue that too much democracy leads to populist excesses and poor outcomes. I heard a phrase in, in an essay on the radio this morning where that populism was referred to as often toxic populism. There are many models of democracy that reflect a variety of values, priorities, and conceptions of how we ought to live together. Canada is a parliamentary democracy and a constitutional monarchy marked by extensive civil liberties, a vibrant political culture, a well-functioning government, vibrant pluralism, regular and legitimate elections, and moderate political participation rates. The UK-based Economist Intelligence Unit created an index to measure and categorize the state of democracy in 167 countries around the world. It's no surprise that in 2016, Canada ranked sixth in the world and is categorized as a full democracy. As compared to the US, which sits at 21st and is categorized as a flawed democracy. However, Canada's ranking on one of the index measures, and that particular measure is about participation rates, was quite low. Do we really enable wide participation of everyone in our democracy and in our democratic processes? This will be uh, an area of focus for the service today. That's a deep topic, and so I wrote a poem for democracy. When humans left the wild places that demanded cooperation or death, they thought they left a brutal world for one of safety and progress. Let it not be said that this is not true, for the most part, as anyone can see. We have made ourselves the good life, those of us with opportunity and skill. It is those who come into the world at the bottom end of things, the poor, neglected, tired, hungry, and abused, that charity reaches to ameliorate. Our duty is to create inclusion, to build societies that encourage, nurture, educate, and equalize rights, prosperity, and justice. Our faith is based on democracy, the freedom to believe, to grow, to be welcome at the voting places, to have a say about our governance. We come together with regularity to celebrate and promote these values so that all seekers after truth find it here and in the world. Democracy, as Susan has said, is a work in progress. We know we must ever be vigilant against principalities and powers that would see its very death. 
We are the voices and the actions. On our shoulders rest duties that will take us a long time to do. But we will get there. We know we will. Uh, We are delighted today to have a guest with us. Sarah Eady is sitting here in the front row, and I'm going to ask Jeff Bizantz if he will come up and give her proper introduction. Well, I don't know how proper this introduction will be, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Sarah Eady. Sarah is a staff lawyer at the Edmonton Community Legal Center, and she really works on the front lines of poverty in many ways because she winds up providing services for people of low income who need legal services and advice. I first met Sarah when we were both on the Mayor's Task Force for the Elimination of Poverty, which eventually became End Poverty Edmonton. Early in that process, we were all trying to make sense of what we're supposed to do. Um, That is, what was this task force supposed to accomplish? How are we supposed to define poverty? What's the best way to do that? And how do we think about poverty and what to do about it? And people came up with lots of ideas, all of which we talked through, sort of like making sausage. Sometimes you don't want to know too much about the process, but you hope the outcome is good. Uh, So... We talked about transportation, we talked about housing, we talked about racism, we talked about early learning and care for, for young children, for the families with young children, lots of things that contribute to poverty and trying to figure out what can be done about these things and how to best frame that. And as that conversation went on, I think we were all aware that things were being left out. That's often the way conversations in groups go. And Sarah stood up and said at one point, what about democratic participation and justice? And it it just hit everyone like a log to the head. And everyone said, duh, how could we have overlooked that all this time? And Sarah spoke quite eloquently about it. It was her passion, and it became everyone's passion. When I looked at the first reading that Wendy read today, and it says, we believe that all people should have a voice and a vote about things that concern them, that could have been Sarah who wrote that. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you today Sarah Eady. Sarah? Jeff is really being far too kind and generous in uh, exaggerating the role that I played um, in that task force, but hey, I'll, I'll take it, right? <laughs> Good morning, friends. Thank you all so much for inviting me here today to join your conversation about democracy and democratic participation. I, I do have a bit of a shaky voice today because I've had a hard time getting over a cold, so just forgive me if I uh, stop for a moment and take a sip of water. So contrary to what Jeff has told you, please know I am not an expert in uh, po- politics of any kind, um, political systems or history of any or anything of that sort. I'm just a woman, a lawyer by trade, who like all of you care, care deeply about my community and my neighbours. I was lucky enough to get an invitation to join Edmonton's task force for the elimination of poverty. And it was because of the experience that I have every day at my day job as a poverty lawyer, um, as Jeff said, representing low-income Edmontonians with a wide variety of legal problems, not the kind of areas of law that most lawyers work with, housing law, human rights law. You know, I don't myself do it, but we do some family law and immigration law and income supports appeals, all those things that um, the people who have those legal problems can't really pay a lawyer to do. Because of that work, I was gifted the opportunity to co-chair one of the working groups with the task force. So our job was to develop recommendations for how we can eliminate poverty through justice and democratic participation. So that's, I think, why I was invited here today, although my background is really more with the, ju- was, was more with the justice side than the, than the democratic participation side. What I've learned about democratic participation, I learned through that process and I learned through the people who joined that working group and you had more experience with that than I did coming in. So there you go. By the way, I was so pleased and impressed to learn that one of the guiding principles, and I, I, it was already mentioned, but of the Unitarian churches to affirm and promote the use of the democratic process, not just within the congregation, but in society at large. I really think that's something to celebrate. I've never heard of any other faith group doing that, and I, I just think that's fabulous. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about voting 
and also other ways we can and should participate in the democratic process. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work we did on the task force where we really identified that in order to create a more just community, we needed to invite everyone into the democratic process to strengthen our democracy by ensuring everyone's voices are heard. So we in Canada have a kind of, of representative democracy, right? We vote for representatives. Whichever person in our geographical, geographical area gets the most votes becomes our representative, and then all the representatives get together and decide what our laws will be. That's, of course, not the only type of democracy that we have. Anyone who has children or has recently had children in grade six will have heard all about Athenian democracy, kind of direct democracy where every male adult citizen who was not a slave had to vote on every law. So you can see from that example that those who vote have power over what laws are made and the categories of who gets to vote is not fixed. It's changed over the centuries and it's expanding, but that work is still ongoing. In Western Canada, most women got the right to vote in provincial elections in 1916 and the right to vote in federal elections in 1918, although there wasn't another election until 1921. Before that, women weren't considered persons. It took a court challenge all the way to the British Privy Council to fix that. So you see, lawyers can do good in the world, <laughs> con contrary to popular belief. Canadians with what the federal government in their wisdom refers to as Indian status did not get the right to vote until 1960. Prisoners did not earn the right to vote in federal elections until 2002 which took a challenge to the Supreme Court of Canada. Again, there's the lawyers making a difference. And who still does not have the vote here in Canada today? Non-citizens. So that includes permanent residents who haven't, for whatever reason, whether it be time or other considerations, haven't gotten their citizenship yet. The large numbers of temporary foreign workers that we have in Alberta who are here working sometimes for a decade, um, undocumented people, all people under the age of 18, people who haven't lived long enough in a particular geographical area. To vote in the municipal election, you just have to live here on voting day. But to vote in the provincial election, you have to have lived in Alberta for the last six months. And I hear, although I'm not up on everything that they're doing, but I understand that they're contemplating in a very preliminary way extending municipal voting rights to non-citizens, which is also being contemplated, I believe, in, in uh, some other communities, including Vancouver and to people aged 16 and up, which I think would be fabulous because by the time we're 16, we've learned in school all about it, and by the time we're 18, we've probably forgotten if it's not part of our habit to vote, right? But practically speaking, the requirements exclude some people from the right to vote. You have to have ID to vote. A lot of our most vulnerable residents, and I can tell you this for sure, do not have ID, um, whether that results from continuously losing their ID, not having a safe place to store their belongings. Our office goes, goes into the jails and tries to create a form of statutory declaration ID for people who are being released from prison. But those are people who do, you know, we, we've done, I want to say a thousand last year of IDs like that. People who are homeless, so they can't show proof of residence in a particular geographical area. Sometimes you need a utility bill. Well, if you're homeless, you don't have a utility bill, right? So the requirements to prove that you, who you are and where you live can exclude people from the right to vote. If you have a vote, you have power, but you also have responsibilities. Citizenship is a set of rights and responsibilities. We are all of us responsible for what our government does. We don't get to abdicate that responsibility just because we're a representative democracy and we voted. Often we'll say, oh, I can't say anything because I didn't vote, or you hear people say that. Well, you still can, and even if you voted, you still, we still have a responsibility for what our government does. Informed voting is the first step. It matters, and it's really important. And our municipal election participation rates are abysmal. It's like 35% or so. But if you want to participate fully in democracy, if you want to meet your responsibilities, your work can't end with a vote. The people that we elect they then rely on us, their constituents, to keep them apprised of what's happening in their communities, what needs doing, what people think. That's our job, is to, once we voted, the person is elected, then we have to help them to shape our laws in the way we want them. So some ideas 
about what we can do to do that. And of course, this is not a, a fixed list. It changes all the time. It depends on who we are, which particular area we're living in. But what I think, anyway, we have an obligation to be informed about the issues that matter to us and that matter in our communities. So that means listening to and respecting different opinions. It means supporting independent journalism so that there is proper, real information coming to us. Um, in this information age, we sure have a lot of misinformation. We really should have an opportunity to really know what's happening and it can help us to inform our decisions. Then we need to share what we learn. We need to talk to our friends, our neighbors, and our colleagues and use our social media, write to the traditional media, really share, while we're listening, share what we have learned. Then we need to tell our elected officials what we think. There are so many ways for us to do this. We can write to people. We can drop into constituency offices. Almost all of our elected officials have an office where people can go and talk to them. The city does a fabulous job of public consultations. So they can hold them, but if we don't go, <laughs> then the consultations are not actually gathering people's input. So we need to make the effort to go to those consultations, listen to what our neighbors are saying, and share our opinions. We have the opportunity to go to city council meetings and often register to speak there if we have a strong opinion. We can participate in the political process by joining a political party, helping a candidate with their campaign, or running for political office. And outside of the elected government, a lot of important decisions that impact our everyday lives are actually made by what we call ADCs, or agencies, boards, and commissions. So we can join, a lot, a lot of times there's a call out for people to join agencies, boards, and commissions, and they can have just as much of an impact on people's daily lives as the government itself. At a more local level, we can contribute to make our communities better by getting involved. Not everything worth doing is done by the government. We can join our community league, volunteer with a civil society organization or not-for-profit, post a block party, start a community garden, really get engaged in our neighborhoods. And we can stand up for what we believe in. We need to be vocal, we need to advocate, we need to protest and do the hard work of making sure that everybody's rights are respected. So the one I'm going to add to this list today that is maybe not something that we talk about every day and it's important from my perspective, is to help other people find their voice. Because to do all those things I've just talked about, it takes privilege. And a government which reflects only the input of the privileged is not a true democracy. At the task force, we spent a long time, as Jeff said, over <laughs> quite a few months defining poverty. In the end, we defined it as lacking or being denied the economic, social, and cultural resources to fully and meaningfully participate in community. At the heart of well-being is participating in community, is citizenship. To be poor is not only to lack the basic necessities of life, but also to be disenfranchised. Uh, people living in poverty have low voting rates, they don't run as candidates in elections, and then they are unrepresented at the decision and policy-making tables. Their voices are not heard, and it matters. I can't remember who told me this, but I believe it was a senior judge on the Court of Queen's bench. And in Alberta, if you don't know, we have gender parity on our Court of Queen's bench. So for every man that's appointed as a justice of the Court of Queen's bench, we also appoint a woman. And we've had that for quite a while. And it was a senior member of the bench who told me that the change to having gender parity on the court made a bigger difference to the quality of the decisions and the tenor of the decisions coming out of that court than the advent of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. For a lawyer, that is like a shocking thing to hear because the char we all have the charter hanging on our wall. We look up to this and we say, this is the rule of law that makes it fair. And yet, from the people who are working in the courts, they're telling us what actually makes it fair is having representation on the bench, equal representation. So if we look at our current city council, 12 councillors, one male. One male. <laughs> so funny. One mayor. <laughs> of those 13 people, 12 are men 
and 12 are white people. That is not representative of our community. In the Edmonton metropolitan area, our population is a little over a million people. About half of those people identify European origins. About 30% are visible minority, and between 5 and 6% are Aboriginal. So if we look at our city council and we look at our population base, we know, although we say we have a representative democracy, we've got a long way to go. The only way to increase the diversity on our city council is to increase the diversity of the candidates. We need more women to run for political office, more people with disabilities, more Indigenous Edmontonians, more visible minorities, more newcomers, more young people. And there are, there, there are organizations working on this, by the way. Equal Voice, I learned about recently, is dedicated to electing more women to all, all levels of political office in Canada, federal, provincial, municipal, band council. And it's tricky to do because there are many you know, systemic problems that prevent women from running for office. If you see the kind of uh, abuse that women candidates and politicians take, you can understand why we might not want to run for office. As part of our community consultations with End Poverty Edmonton, I talked to literally dozens of groups of people, and I listened when they told me what needs to change in the political system to end poverty. And I just, I, I mean, I wrote it all down, I went back and I looked at it, and I wrote down kind of word for word, here are the frustrations that I heard from people. I don't know how to influence decisions. I don't trust politicians. The politicians don't come to our neighborhoods, just the bill collectors. Uh, through a translator, we heard, we don't know where to vote or how. There, there isn't time to learn that with our work. They won't accept a status card as ID. We need the opportunity to sit with people who make decisions, to see them and share our problems with them. They need to understand what our lives are like, how difficult our budgets are. Uh, in discussing the agencies, boards, and commissions with clients at an organization helping people with mental illness, we heard, I don't think I'd be able to follow the training. The wording might be hard to understand. Why do you have to have seven to ten years of management experience to sit on a board? Couldn't we make it mandatory to have a low-income person on every board or a person with a disability? I don't have a voice. I'm a second-class citizen. I feel like if I speak out, I'll be called a rowdy native. I feel powerless. So underlying those things, those very real things that we heard, we kind of did a little bit of work unpacking that and looking for the systemic barriers that are keeping people out of uh, the democratic process. There are linguistic and cultural barriers. And of course, if you've got you know, everyone in power, or not everyone, that's not fair, but the vast majority of people in power from one linguistic and cultural background, then that's, you know, that's, it reproduces itself, right? I was really pleased to see that the city on their website for the municipal election has information about the election in a lot of different languages. We, we can see practical barriers like lack of time, lack of transportation, lack of childcare options. Low wage earners and single parent households have very, very little leisure time and it's often not at the time when um, opportunities are there for, for participation. Physical barriers. So we know that politicians door knock and that works best for people living in single family households where there aren't locked access doors where people work office hours, and in neighborhoods where politicians and their campaign volunteers feel safe. The processes that we use to vet candidates for decision-making positions, like all of us, right? The, proce the processes we use, we value you know, education, experience, etc. That privilege is privilege. And then we see the work of subtle and systemic racism, colonialism, and other forms of discrimination. There aren't easy solutions to these complex systemic problems, of course. It needs to be ongoing work by all of us to dismantle these barriers and try to make sure that everyone has the resources they need to fully and meaningfully participate in community. So I invite all of us here, including me, this is work that I need to do too, to add that to our list of things that we need to do to participate in democracy, to work at building a community where everyone's voice is heard and dismantling the barriers so we have neighbors, they may be here in the church community, they may be where we live, they may be where we work, 
We need to make sure that we invite everyone's voices in. So I encourage you to remember the responsibilities of democracy. We don't have to vote on every single piece of legislation anymore like the free men of Athens did, but our work doesn't end with our vote tomorrow. That's just where it starts. So I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you who may know a lot more about this than me will have to add to this conversation after the service is over with Soup. And I thank you for listening to me today. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm looking forward to our conversations over Soup as well. Timothy Snyder is an author and historian whose most recent book is entitled On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Recently, he posted an essay entitled 20 Lessons for Citizens of an Imperiled Democracy. I found that uh, essay, by the way, on a UU uh, web page out of the States. In it, Snyder identified 20 lessons from the 20th century that we need to pay attention to if our democracies are to thrive. I'm not going to read all 20. (laughs) Honest. (laughs) Soup is waiting. But here are three that particularly struck me. Lesson number seven. Stand out. Someone has to. It's easy in words and deeds to follow along. It can feel strange to do or say something different. But without that unease, there is no freedom. And the moment you set an example, the spell of the status quo is broken and others will follow. Lesson number eight, believe in the truth. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is but spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. Lesson nine, investigate. Figure things out for yourself. Spend more time with longer articles. Subsidize investigative journalism. Subscribe to print media. Realize that some of what is on your screen is there to harm you. Yes, democracy is more than just voting, but voting is one of the critical expressions of our democratic way of life, and I encourage you all to cast your votes tomorrow.